晚上愉快些。Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Let's turn to the hymn number number one eighty three, and we will sing of Jesus' love. Let's praise the Lord. Him will be 286 in the hymn books. Wonderful words of life.
on page in the hymnals 294. Power in the blood. That's Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to welcome every one of you here. Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day to worship together. There's no better place to be on Saturday morning than here in church among brothers and sisters. I want to thank you since past couple weeks we've been on the boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada. It's beautiful. Two weeks without cell phone coverage. <laughs> I, 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 I was amazed that the world's still standing after that, but it, 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 it's amazing. <laughs> it's not that important. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me tell you, though, there is, there is life outside of electronics. Thank, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I want to also men make mention we've got, some, we've got a vibrant church, and we've got a lot of things going on. I mean, we've got a lot of things going on. If you look at the bulletin, You'll be able to read up on those things. One of these things, uh, we'll go ahead and make mention. That, uh, if you want to know how to reverse diabetes, and in medicine, we, in official medicine, diabetes cannot be changed or reversed. I've got news. It can be reversed, and it's through God's methods. Bev Cook, you know, has a class diabetes reversal. It's in your insert. Take a look at that. It also affects blood pressure, your risk for cancer. It affects... Uh, all aspects of your health, definitely it's worth going to. If you want to reverse any kind of medical issues, definitely look into that. Uh, Robert, you've got a message for us for men's misery? Gentlemen, do I have your attention? Most gentlemen like Milwaukee tools, right? If you look on our bulletin board out in the hallway, there's one of these flyers out there. Gentlemen, our men's retreat is September 29, October 1, the last weekend of this month. Fantastic speakers. Freddie Rivera has the Hispanic track and Marty Miller has the English track. You will come back a better man if you attend this weekend with us. You will come back more relaxed and more spirit-filled. 
Ladies, if you need a quiet weekend at home, please encourage your man to come and sharpen his tools. Maybe you want to sponsor him. All right, thank you, Robert. And do you know, tomorrow afternoon, we've got a major deal here. We've got tents being set up and all that. There is the health fair and car show. If you like old time cars, come on and help. I understand we've got some music going on too. Bluegrass music. You guys like bluegrass. So this is the heart of bluegrass country, right? Let's, let's come on out, come on out. Enjoy, the, enjoy that. We've, there's a lot of health uh, booths that have been set up, a lot of health ministries. It will be helpful to bring your own chairs in case, you know, or you can pull up some turf and sit on the ground if you wanted to, but yeah, by all means, by all means. Okay, um, will, uh, will there be a blood drive as well? Okay, not this year, okay. All right, well, come on out, we'll, you'll, you'll definitely enjoy it. Now, let's go ahead and have, open this service, Pastor. I invite you to kneel as we have our call to worship. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blessings of life, the opportunities that you give us each and every week to stop, to listen, to rest, to come together in fellowship. As we gather this morning, we invite your spirit to be upon us, that we may understand and see more clearly your person. Bless us as we carry that then to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our morning hymn is Lift Him Up. Let us stand and sing number 371.
now it's time for the children's story. If we'll, the children will come forward and gather the, the offerings here. Bob Dindy will be giving us our story this morning. Wow, I'm looking at so many beautiful people, but most of all, I'm looking at some awesome, awesome future witnesses for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy Sabbath, kids. You all look radiant. I'm so blessed to be here. Can we have a word of prayer, please, before we start? Dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, I've been blessed so richly by these children, by these congregation, by our pastor, by everyone, but mainly by you, Father, and for Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. I now ask that you send your Holy Spirit and let these words be yours, Lord. I give you all the honor, glory, and praise, but please make this have a lasting impact on these children throughout their life and into the kingdom where we can all be together forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this story came to me this week about midnight. And I hadn't had a whole lot of sleep because, as you all know, I'm fighting some pretty, pretty bad back issues. But yesterday, I had the joy of having a five inch needle stuck in my back with steroids. <laughs> I'm being, I'm kidding. It wasn't joyful, but I'm hoping there in a few days I'll be able to walk a little better. The name of my story is called The Pharisee and the Four Foot Angel. Many, many years ago, there was a Pharisee who grew up loving the Lord. His family loved the Lord, and he did too. As he grew up, he worked very, very hard doing extremely difficult jobs, such as digging ditches in the, in the middle of summer in the hard clay ground where he lived. He lived in the country far from the city and with only a few farms about 20 miles away. He had many sisters and a brother, but he was the youngest and the most outgoing of them all. His family worshiped the Lord and trusted God for everything. Could you get that water? See that thing? I'm sorry, I'm really dry, folks. Um, I just need a sip of this, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
They had very little money, but a whole lot of love. And God blessed the Pharisee with enough food and shelter, plus hand-me-down robes from friends of his parents. He was so glad to get them, even when some people who didn't know the Lord teased him because some of the robes were too big for him. He didn't realize they were making fun, and his big brother would jump in and say that he put it on by mistake, and it was really his own because he was four years older than the Pharisee. The Pharisee wasn't too smart at that time and didn't realize he was being made fun of. He was just glad to have a new robe, even if it was too big. As the Pharisee grew older, his three sisters and big brother taught him to read, swim, and do a bunch of things kids his age couldn't do. They loved him so much, and he loved them so much. Their parents loved God and praised him for every blessing, great and small. As the Pharisee grew older, he started hanging around other young adults that were not good people. And the Pharisee wanted to be popular and started doing things God and his family wouldn't approve of. The Pharisee got married and had two fine sons of his own, and they all got baptized together. The Pharisee and his sons were so happy, and God blessed him greatly. God continues to bless the Pharisee, and his wealth and his belongings increased greatly. The Pharisee knew it was because of God and gave generously to many charities every time he got paid he returned tithe to the God who had blessed him. Still, the Pharisee longed for the feeling he had when he and his sons had been baptized 20 years earlier. All of a sudden, the Pharisee was in so much pain, he couldn't stand it. He prayed every day that God would let him fall asleep and wake him up when Jesus came back to take us all to heaven. The doctors offered no hope, and the Pharisee became discouraged. He reached out to brother, his brother, and sisters, and asked for prayers on his behalf. He rode his camel to the sanctuary in tremendous pain and, and was barely able to make it inside. A, a four-foot-tall angel handed, handed him a church bulletin, and five minutes later went into the sanctuary and handed him and his own personal walking stick that his dad had bought him at a market. The Pharisee thanked the angel and told him that after church, he would use it to get, to get back to his camel and then give it back. The angel said, I don't, want you, I don't want it back. I want you to have it. That Pharisee is me, and I have a gift for that angel. That angel is named Logan. Can let me show you this stick. David Rowe. You know, sometimes we get a double blessing from God. And Logan, this is for you. You blessed me, Logan. Do you remember the children's story I told about ripples? That, that you remember everyone? Logan is that ripple, and he is spreading God's love and unselfishly gave me this walking stick. David, is there anything else back there for Logan? God bless you, Logan. You touched my heart like you would not believe, and I hope you enjoy that stick and don't think about me. Think about the God that inspired me to give that to you. So, do you remember the story of Elijah and Elisha? When Elijah went to heaven, Elisha asked Elijah to, what, to give him a, <clears throat> a double blessing. And you're getting a double blessing. I want you to, I want you to show the people the top of the, the taller. <clears throat> Take the ribbon off. Stand up, please. You can take both ribbons off, you can look at them, but they're both very unique. And one, I want you to show the, show the people what's on the very top of it. I want you to tell them what's there. Take that off. Do you know what's there? What's it there? No, this one right. You can take it off both. 
what is there in the end of that? A compass. A compass. Let that compass always guide you in the path that Jesus wants you to go. Don't ever be influenced by kids that don't love the Lord and they want you to do bad things. It can make a horrible impact, but thankfully, God will keep you on the right track. So use that compass. Think of true north as heaven and Jesus, our Savior, and always focus. You can take the end of this off if you'd like. You can have those ribbons. And what is so cool, everyone, is there was a girl in Lake Chimney Rock, and I can't mention because we're live, but there was a, a, a little store, and I looked everywhere to try to find <clears throat> little walking sticks that would mean something to Logan, and, and my son was with me, and you can show him the other one if you'd like. It doesn't have a compass. It's one that he can just go out with his dad. You want to show them this other walking stick? But it's, it's beautiful, and it's, got a, it's carved. It's got the leather. And hold that one up, please. And I could barely make it into church last, last Sabbath. And Logan, I was sitting with Kelly Edney, and Logan walked up and handed this to me and told me he didn't want to see me. He, he handed it, and, and I, again, I told him I would give it back to him after church. He said, I don't want it. It's yours. And that touched my heart. And Logan is a very special young man, and God loves him, and I love you. Logan, will you come here and let me say a, <clears throat> let me say a closing prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for blessing me with Logan, for what he's done. Be with his dad, Richard, Father. He's a single parent raising Logan, just like I was with my two sons. It's challenging, Lord. But above all, send your angels, wrap them around Logan and Richard. Bless them greatly, but help them always remember true north and Jesus and heaven. I ask these things in your holy, blessed, and wonderful name. Amen. Logan, well done. Well done. Well, the deacons come forward. It's time for our worship and giving. This week's worship and giving is going to be an offering for radio ministries. Even though we were in the boondocks, we still got radio reception. <laughs> but again, it just goes to show God can reach places that, you know, that we can't even imagine of. And, and, and it shows, shows how close we are to the end as well, how God can reach even the most darkest and deepest places of the earth. Heavenly Father, please be with us as we participate in this worship service. And Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit be within our hearts as we contribute to your work, Lord. The mites that we give, we pray that you will multiply Multiply in such a way that, multiple, that many souls will be saved, we pray. Although we ourselves may not be on the forefront of these missionary works that need to be performed, we know that through our offerings, you can perform many miracles. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the fact that you are working not, our, in, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those who are seeking you and who need you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
It's time now for our morning prayer. Those of you that would like to come forward uh, as we bring our petitions and praises to the Lord, I invite you to do so. The rest of you may kneel or bow your heads where you are. Our most gracious, loving Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be given us to come to you, as scripture would say, boldly, to address you at your throne, to share what our heart ye yearns for. So this morning we bow together to open our hearts to you, the things that we are thankful for, the things we are hopeful for, the things that we may need. Bless us in regards to your kingdom being well served. Thank you, Lord, for hearing the prayers of those who are in pain and hurting, those who are joyful. May we continue to praise you for the blessings we receive and look forward to son's soon return as our prayer in his name. Amen. Amen. This morning's scripture is coming from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, if everyone will stand in reverence for God's word. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that in tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You may be seated. Can I use this microphone? Yeah. Good morning, church family. Good morning. My name is Steve. I didn't say that last time I was here. I did some music and enjoyed it so much. Uh, I was a lay pastor at Camden Church for 10 years. My wife, Michelle, back there, say hello. She's uh, her dad and my father-in-law is Harry Robinson. I'm sure you know him. But uh, I was trying to figure out what to sing. I don't never decide. I let the Lord decide that. And uh, I was looking, I saw an ad for, remember American Express Traveler's Checks, remember those? The slogan was, don't leave home without them. And I thought, I had a good song, uh, don't leave home without Jesus, right? Because, you know, we, sometimes we study our devotion for two minutes and we out the door. And he's like, oh, I wanted to go with you. I got everything you planned for you. And, uh, so this song is called uh, The Mind of Christ. Hope you enjoyed it. Is too loud? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Good. Testing? Okay. Better? Okay, thank you. Okay. 
As I leave to start my day, Jesus has prepared my way. If I seek him early on, he will take me through the storm. Through the storm. Help me, Lord, to love thee more than I ever loved before. In my work and in my play, be there with me through the day. Through the day. Let this mind of Christ be yours. He has promised he will open up the door. And if we seek him with all our heart, he will surely fill this place. If we'll only seek his face. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Thy love will guard me through the night and wake me with the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Let this mind of Christ be yours. He has promised he will open up the door. And if we seek him with all our heart, he will surely fill this place. If we'll only seek his face. If we'll only seek his face. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to see all of you here today. Nice, cool Sabbath morning. You could be out by the river or the lake or up in the mountains. But you chose to be here. That's a good thing. You can go out there later. <laughs> the end of summer is just around the corner. May not feel like it quite yet, but it's coming. And with that comes harvest. In fact, many are already putting up their garden's store. Gardening is quite frequently a challenge. Not only are you concerned with your thumb, you know, whether it's green or not, but you also have to deal with unpredictable weather. Cool, wet, hot, dry. And sometimes, if not always, it can be very difficult to raise a garden beyond the weeds to actually have produce. But I'm still grateful to live in a place that allows for a good growing season. I mean, how would you like to live somewhere that the season was really, really short or that was constantly dry and no water at all or there was too much water? I mean, Right here seems to be fairly balanced, and I'm glad to be a part of the Tryon community. Right here is a good place to grow a garden, even if the weeds are a little more abundant than normal. But. More than 2,300 years ago, the folk who lived in Alexandria, which is Egypt, northern Africa, could not grow enough food. They were some of those whose weather conditions weren't quite appropriate. And so they were dependent, totally and completely dependent, on the eastern Mediterranean lands, Phoenicia, for their grain, their wheat. Of course, they called it corn, but it was their wheat that they would die if they didn't have it come in. 
And so their total life was dependent upon the arrival of the food. At a certain time of the year when their supplies began to run low, even run out sometimes, they would be hoping that the, the ships would appear just above and beyond the horizon, bringing in a great supply of wheat that had been grown. People would stand on lookout, watching carefully. The communications weren't like today where you could telephone ahead or telegraph ahead or even send a, a smoke signal. You had to wait to see, to actually see the coming of the ship. And so they would watch, and they would watch. And when they saw those great grain ships peering over the horizon, a joy welled up inside of them because now life was within sight. The food was coming. And what a great day it was as those heavy laden ships came closer and closer and the good news spread quickly that the food was coming. The Greek speaking folks living in Alexandria coined a special word, a special word for this very event to announce the good news that the grain ships had arrived in port. The word was evangelion in Greek. Often we interpret it as being good news or even the gospel. That's where the word came from. The gospel was the good news of this life-supporting grain coming into shore. Let's stop and have a word of prayer. Our Father, we are thankful for the gospel, for your message, the good news. Life support is available. Help us to understand that more clearly and then share with others the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless us in our study this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. This morning, if you were here early, Oh, probably most of you weren't, right? No. Okay. We had a Bible quiz, which should be an inspiration for each of us to take the Word with us. Now, not all of us can get it crammed in up here, but we can at least carry it with us. So this morning I invite you to turn in your Bible, presuming you have one, to Mark 16. Mark 16, Matthew, Mark, second book of the Gospels, chapter 16, the last chapter of Mark, and verse 15, getting close to the end of that chapter. And it reads, And he said unto them, Go ye unto all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. The good news. The grain has come. The life system support is there. Go ye. And who's he talking to? His disciples. His followers. You. He's talking to you. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Share the good news to every single one. Now what is this gospel that we want to share? There's food on the table. Ring the dinner bell. Right? No, that's good enough news. But not quite the good news. What is this good news? Well, the good news to us, as we look is that Jesus is come. That Jesus, our Savior, has come. Basically, we are excited that, that this good and merry and, and joyful tidings is for us to share with others. It's the news that makes man's heart glad. The gospel is, Jesus has come. And brought life to the dying, starving world. 
mankind. To recognize that without Jesus coming, we are all doomed. Now take your Bible and turn to Romans. A little further over. Romans chapter 1. Verse 16. We find here that Paul is going to make a statement about the gospel. As we study it, we even see that it is a definition more clearly for us and what that then means to us. Chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Does that apply to each one of us? Are you ashamed to share with other people that you're a Christian? Are you ashamed to share with other people that you are a follower of Christ? Are you ashamed to share the good news that Christ is available for everyone and that through Him we can have salvation? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. To the Jew first, then also to, beyond that, the Greeks. So the gospel is not only the good news that we are saved. The gospel is the good news that God provides the power to the Christian, the power of God is provided and available to everyone who believes. It's not just there's good news in Jesus, he saves you, duh. It goes beyond that. As we're going to continue to read, verse 17, For therein, this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall Live by faith. Now, Seventh-day Adventists believe in the gospel. No doubt about it. In fact, on many of our church signs and business cards, and frequently you find even in the churches, the three angels. Three angels. Have you ever looked up there? You ever noticed? How many of you noticed that up there? Did you realize that for about a year the light bubbles burn out? One of them was? All right. The second angel picked up his light, <laughs> thanks to the deacons. But the three angels' message of Revelation 14 is vital to us as a people because it is our message to share with the world, and it is inclusive of the very gospel that we need to be proclaiming, the good news to share to every people, nation, kindred, tongue, anybody, everybody. It is our objective to share the good news, the gospel, to share Jesus with every single person that we have opportunity to interact with. And even beyond that, we take up offerings so that we can send this message other places that we don't interact with other people. To realize that Jesus is coming. And when that happens, when this good news, according to Matthew, is spread around the world to every ear, Jesus will come. Now there's a lot of gobbledygook about how we're saved and what actually the gospel really means or is. So before we can preach the gospel, maybe we need to understand in our hearts exactly what is this gospel message. And as hard as it may be to comprehend, you could probably ask 10 different people, what, what is the gospel? And you'd probably get a number of different answers, maybe even 10 different answers. But this morning I wanted to, to, to categorize this message probably in three different points that are typically what people might think. Three different views of how people think that we are saved, what this gospel means to me. First off, some feel like that we are saved by totally and completely believing in Jesus, period. And that works have nothing to do with our salvation. Therefore, that we can live however we want to live, do whatever we want to do, because works aren't the critical issue of salvation. That what you do is not why are you saved. 
Now, some people call this a new theology, but it's been around for a long, long time. Second viewpoint is that some people believe that we are saved by faith plus our own personal works. That Jesus saves us, yes, that's true, but that we now have to manifest the, the good works so that we can grow to be more and more like Jesus. And that our perfection of our soul is what's important. Now there are those probably who like this idea and aren't going to like that I'm going to label it as legalism. All right? And then there's a third way that I believe the gospel in itself shares more completely, as we have just read. That Jesus saves us, correct? And that we are saved totally and completely by believing in Him. And that He totally in provides that righteousness for us. And then He provides the power to live a Christian life. That we are not saved by our works, but we are saved by His works in us because he empowers us to live the Christian life, which is what we just read. It's that empowering part. The first of these three views, probably we could label as cheap grace. You know, just believe and that's all you gotta worry about. The second one is legalism. And the third view, I believe, is a more balanced view of truly what scripture brings out and which we're gonna look at a little closer as we continue on this morning. I want to define gospel for you. What is the good news? What is the gospel? Uh, what is it that saves you? This morning the title of the sermon is Salvation by Gift Certificate. A gift certificate. How are you saved? You're not saved by securing salvation on your own. There's nothing you can do to assure yourself of salvation except that you turn it over to God. Recognizing that salvation is provided by somebody else that has totally paid it in full. Christ. So that now I accept then the gift certificate that I can trade for eternal life. We all want something for nothing, right? I mean, when I first saw that toolbox, whew, Robert doesn't need that, I know. He's got a whole big shed he puts all this stuff in. But now me, on the other hand, we all want something for nothing, right? No? All right, so you're going to go looking for bargains then. All right. So you don't expect something for nothing, but you could, you could get something for cheap, right? Looking for that bargain, clipping coupons, filling out things for a free drawing, right? You know, you could get $250 if you just sign up and take this little survey and now they're gonna send you stuff forever and ever. Or dare I say, take a risk on the lottery. Please don't. We all want to win. How many times is the word win mentioned in the Bible? Only twice. Only twice does it appear in the Bible. Paul speaks of one of these in Philippians, if you want to turn there. Philippians, flip on over to Philippians. It's just a little ways past Romans. Philippians, chapter 3, verse 8. Paul speaking says, I count all things but loss. I count all things but as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. That is my goal. Continuing, he says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things... And even what I do have, I only count them as garbage, dung, 
that I may win Christ. So how do we get Christ? We win. We win. It's not that I had to buy it, but I win. It's a gift. It's just given to me. Salvation is gained by winning it. Not by efforts we have to put into it. We just have to accept it. I got a gift for you. Would you like it? How many times have you hung up? It's because we have chosen Him that we are the winner. If you choose Jesus, you are an instant winner. If you choose the world, you're a big loser. Do you know that every dollar that goes into the lottery that you might win, but you won't? Somebody else lost it. And you think you're a big winner until you realize you only get about half of what they say it's worth, right? So really you're not as big a winner as you thought. But think of it took all of those people to lose it. Salvation is free. But salvation is not a cheap commodity. Take note. There's a cost factor involved for salvation. For you it may be free, but it costs sweat and tears and blood for Jesus to make that available to you for free. And that is a high price. And yet Jesus today simply gives it away. He just gives it away to His friends that they too can possess that perfect righteousness through their faith in Jesus Christ. Presented to the Father as pure, perfect, righteous, justified in His sight. But realize Jesus paid that price. And He knew it when He did it. Because on the cross we find those words in John 19 verse 30, It is finished. What exactly was finished? Have you ever thought about that? This Greek word that Jesus was using was tetelesi, which in our version of Scripture we read it as, it is finished. But what does that mean in reality? What's finished? Is there any definition to the, I mean, is there any explanation into the term in Greek that would define it better than just say, you know, I'm finished, sermon's done. Archaeologists have done some digging around and have found an, a Latin equivalent to this word, consumatum est, scrawled across ancient tax receipts, indicating that it was paid in full. So when Jesus is saying it is finished, he's in reality saying the debt is now paid in full. He says, I completely paid the price. The sins account was settled on the cross. Our debt, our guilt, totally wiped out. If it's totally wiped out, then there's not any way for you to make a payment, is there? There's nothing you can do because it was at the cross that the debt was totally paid. And there's nothing you can do to pay it anymore. It is paid in full. So all you can do is accept it as a gift certificate. So I obtain Salvation by gift certificate that already has been paid in full. I can't purchase eternal life. Even if I lived a whole life full of good works, it doesn't add one cent to 
to my salvation. So why am I living such a good life then? It's already been done. If somebody gave that to you, would you want to return it with good works? I live a good life because of the good works that God did for me. It's a response to Jesus. It's a response for His gift. I mean, people give me tithes all the time. I won't tell you who gave me this one. Because in reality, I don't remember. <laughs> There's a few I do, but not very often. But I wear them to say thank you. Really? I could choose a different one. You know, which one do I wear today? Well, I wear a tie that you gave me because I say thank you. So I try to wear all my ties. And that's a lot. My good works are a response to the gift of Jesus. He gave his life. He gives me eternal life, his eternal life. And so then the good news doesn't stop with just a certificate. The gift certificate gets put to use every day by me sharing that with other people. When I take my salvation home, Jesus comes home with me to help me apply my gift and use my gift through my life, which is very much unlike the cheap grace to say, yeah, Jesus saved me, I can do what I want. Every now and then, you've probably done this, you purchase something for your children, or maybe your spouse, and it comes in a box. And you open up the box expecting to see exactly what you had ordered, and it's just pieces of what you had ordered, with a piece of paper that says, bolt one goes on hole one with nut one. And you look at the holes and they all look alike. And you look at the bolts and they all look alike. Maybe a little different lengths and sizes or diameters or whatever and then the nuts and some of them have washers and some of them don't. And you ordered it, but what you got was not exactly what you ordered. And you do have to put something into it to have the result, resulted product. And sometimes, for those of you that may have two left hands, it doesn't always go together exactly like you would have anticipated. You know, those little plastic parts just don't fit, or sometimes the, used to you'd have directions and you'd wonder who in the world wrote these directions? Man, a, they've never done this before. <laughs> and now they've gotten to the picture, I've gotten to the point that they don't have words anymore, they just have pictures. That way they don't have to have instructions in all those different languages because things get shipped all over the world. So they just give you pictures. Thinking in some way that you can visualize this into this and see how it goes together and it doesn't always work just right. But the truth is that Jesus not only provides our salvation, but he comes along with the gift and helps us assemble that life and use then the gift that he has given to us as we share with others our Christian life. Imagine that. Jesus creates within us a new heart. He comes into us and lives with us and makes the change on us. So that we have a love for Him and a hatred for sin. A love for good things and no longer enticed with the bad. The truth is that we are totally saved by the blood of Jesus and not by our own blood, sweat, and tears. And it's the same blood then that enables us to live a changed life. It's Christ working in us. Now that doesn't mean we don't make any mistakes. I mean, we make plenty of mistakes, but it's the same blood that has the ability to blot out our sins to the beginning is there to give us complete forgiveness as we move forward in this life. 
Blood is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. It lies at the heart of the gospel. It is through the blood of Christ that Jesus reconciles us to God, the Father. Some years ago, there was a terrible railroad accident that killed many, many people. A commuter train had stalled on the tracks just a few minutes ahead of a freight train that was trucking down the road. The conductor recognized this and sent out a flag down the railroad track to wave and the approaching flyer, being assured that all was well, just a matter of time, the passengers relaxed. But suddenly the speeding freight train came barreling down upon them and the crash left a ghastly scene of horror. The engineer of the speeding train escaped death because he jumped out of his cab before the crash. He was called into court to explain why he had not stopped. He said, I saw the man waving the flag, but it was yellow, and I thought it meant just to slow down a while. When the flag was examined, the mystery was explained. It had been red, but because of long exposure to the sun and weather, it had become a dirty yellow. Just think of the lives that, were in, that are eternally wrecked by the yellow gospels that we present. The bloodless theories of the gospel that send their hearers to doom instead of stopping them on their downward slide. Cheap grace will lead to certain doom. Legalism or perfection is not going to save you either. I mean, I've never met anybody that was perfectly perfect. Perfectly perfect. I don't think any of us could ever equal what Jesus did for us. Jesus Christ gives to you His righteousness. It's not yours. He has given you His righteousness so that you can stand before the Father as perfectly righteous. In God's sight, right now. Jesus and His sacrifice on the cross can redeem your soul. Don't be deceived from some yellow, anemic flag gospel warning that human works are necessary. But recognize those human works are powerless to save you from everlasting destruction. The wonderful truth is that we are truly, totally saved by Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior, Jesus Himself will set you free. Jesus said, John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. An interesting statement that Christians don't apply correctly sometimes because they have this misunderstanding of what is the truth. Have you ever heard it said that we have the truth? Well, we do. But exactly what is that? All too often we want to say the truth is our doctrines. Now, our doctrines are true, but our doctrines are not the truth. I just read you John 8, 32. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. If you're following along, go down in your Bible a couple of more verses to John 8, verse 36. Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, if you put those two together, the parallelism says then the truth is Jesus, the Son. The truth will make you free, and the Son will make you free, so the truth is the Son. In fact, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth, truth and the life. It's knowing Jesus that sets us free. 
Jesus paid for salvation with His perfect life. It's not the doctrines that save you. It's Jesus. We don't have to earn our way to heaven by doing the right thing. We accept Christ. The gift is Jesus. Life. We are saved by Jesus. Doctrines are important. I'm not trying to throw them out. In fact, that's why some people call us a sect. Well, they've almost quit calling us a cult, but now we're a sect, okay? Because they can't understand how we can believe that we are totally and completely saved by Jesus Christ. And yet we still want to keep the commandments. If you're saved by Jesus, why do you go to church on Sabbath? Saturday. If you're saved by Jesus, why do you have to live the way you live? Healthy. Well, let's... I'm married to a wonderful woman, okay? Most of you know her as pastor's wife. That's not her name. <laughs> it's Ramona, exactly. My wife is Ramona. She's not the pastor's wife. She was my wife many years before she became the pastor's wife. I don't know who she married, but anyway. I don't help do the dishes, vacuum the floor, make the bed, whatever it is. I don't help because there's some law that says the pastor should wash dishes on Tuesdays. The pastor should make the bed on Fridays. The pastor should whatever. There's not a law that says I should do that. So I don't. I don't always do that. On occasion, I do something. But it's not because there's a law to do it. Why do I do it? I love her. And I want to please her. Make her happy. Okay? So why would I keep the Sabbath? Not because it's the law, but because I love Jesus and what He did for me. And so I want to keep all the things that He has said were important to keep. We call them sometimes the commandments, but there are other things as well in the Bible that Christ, that God has shared with us that it would be good for us to do. And why do I do that? Oh, because it says so, right? No, it says so, so I'll know what to do to make him happy. The other day I came home. Can I talk about you? Oh, this might get me in trouble. The other day I went to the town and came back and brought her something special. Okay? And... She's all excited because when fall comes, there's certain places that have pumpkin-flavored, so seasoned, whatever things. And she had been talking about this one place that has pumpkin flavors. And so I stopped and got her a pumpkin flavor. And I brought it back to her. She goes, what's this? I said, I just love you. I just happened to go by and think about it, and I stopped and got it. She goes, why? I said, because you've been talking about this pumpkin spice stuff, pumpkin spice. And so I stopped and got something. Pumpkin. She says, well, they have something else that's pumpkin spice that I really wanted. Okay. <laughs> we serve the Lord because he has told us what he likes. <laughs> He has told us the pumpkin spice, whatever it is, is what I like, it's what I prefer. Not just keep any day, there's a certain day. Not just eat any old food, there's certain foods. Don't live a certain way, I mean, don't just live any old way, there's a certain way. God says, this makes me happy. So this is what I should be doing. Eternal life was given as a gift. Because God loved you. 
And in appreciation of that, we give back to him what it is that makes him happy. How do you get the gift anyway? Well, how many of you have ever gotten something significant just because it arrived on your doorstep and you have no idea where it came from? Oh, yes, cool. Doesn't happen very often. Because most times gifts come from people you know. It's important to know the giver. Jesus is our friend. And he wants to, he already knows us. I mean, he knows you inside out. He knows you too, Will. He knows you inside out. He even knows what makes you tick. He put it in motion. But do you know him? Do you know him? Are you willing to accept the gift from some stranger? And you, you look at it and it doesn't have a return address on the envelope. You ever get an envelope with no return address and you think, uh, I don't know about this one. I'm not even going to open it. I don't want to know what it is. And you throw it in the trash. Anybody throw trash in the mail? Mail in the trash without opening it? Do you know that every one of those you've thrown in the trash has a $100 bill in it? <laughs> you need to know someone before you really feel free to accept that gift. It means more to you. The gospel is just one of those things that a loving friend, Jesus, with outstretched hands, is wanting to share with you that gift, the gospel, everlasting life. The only way anyone will ever be lost is if they willfully and consistently reject Jesus and therefore reject His gift of eternal life. You just throw it in the trash without even opening it because you don't know the giver. You need to learn to know the giver so you'll recognize this is His handwriting on the envelope. Or else you'll be lost. Legalism is like a body without a soul. It's just a corpse. Cheap grace is like the soul without the body. Sort of like a ghost. Neither of them work. Only Jesus could live the perfect life in body and in soul. He became the Savior living that perfect life, paying that price, the big price, for a complete salvation for each and every one of us. Then Jesus gives this expensive rescue as a free gift to those who love Him. So where do you get your gift certificate? John 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son... God's Son has eternal life. You get it from Jesus. That's where you get it. Question is, have you got it? That's the question. Have you got it? If so, you are an instant rede winner, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb question you have to answer is have you got it? Let's stand as we sing our closing song, Redeemed number 337. <clears throat>
It's good to see that the child keeps growing. And so it is with us. If we keep Jesus in our heart, then we too can keep growing to see him one day soon. Our Father, we're thankful. Thankful for your love, your plan, for your son. Came to this earth, offered his life for me and each one of those who will truly believe. May we see clearly the gospel that Jesus is coming and offers to us life, not just the grain, but the life that he can live within each of us. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.